Hey, what's up, good people of the world? Um, welcome to uh, the next video in my harmonic relativity series. Um, so go ahead and watch the first videos in the series if you haven't already. So today we're going to be talking about fusion harmony. Okay, so um, some of you who aren't jazz musicians might think, oh, well, why would, you, why, why would I need fusion harmony? Well, fusion harmony um, is just a great uh, little paintbrush to have under your belt. Um, it's a really cool thing to be able to pull out. It's very accessible. A lot of people like fusion harmony. Um, especially if you're writing video game music, you know, chip tune, uh, chip tune music, uh, often employs fusion harmony. I use some in my Pixel Party chip tune track. Um, if you want to check out some good examples of, of um, fusion harmony, you can just look up, you know, you can just type in fusion jazz on YouTube and find a bunch of great examples. As far as some, you know, more modern examples, uh, Jacob Collier um, is a, a British or English, um, a European uh, um, uh, composer and singer who's has excellent stuff, and he has really fantastic fusion harmonic progressions. Um, you know, Snarky Puppy has some great fusion stuff, um, and uh, you know, again, if you listen to like j uh, Japanese uh, chip tune pop, they use, utilize a lot of fusion progressions. So, but you, you'll quickly, if you don't, if you're not sure what the word fusion means, then if you look up some music, you'll quickly kind of get this uh, vibe. It's a very spacey, out there, meditative, like whoa, sort of sound to it. Um, but there's a very specific and surprisingly technical system to creating these fusion chord progressions, which hasn't been discussed uh, at all, to my knowledge, on YouTube, so I figured it'd be a good topic for harmonic relativity. Um, okay, so let's talk about why fusion harmony, or how fusion harmony is different from uh, traditional um, harmony. Okay, so first off, it's primarily voice leading driven, and we'll begin to see what this means more as we start implementing uh, actual progressions and you know writing stuff. But um, it's the choices of chords that you make, as well as how you space them out, um, is primarily dependent on, or the first goal, the, the priority. I'll put it that this way: the priority is to try to make the voice leading as smooth as possible. It's sort of like counterpoint, but the biggest difference between fusion harmony and counterpoint is that um, uh, the rhythms are um, very, very similar to each other. Um, you know, in counterpoint, you want to make the rhythms as distinct as possible, but in uh, fusion harmony, that's, that's not a goal at all because you want it to sound smooth and homogenous, sort of like one voice, okay? All right, it's generally six-part writing, okay? Uh, and six-part... Writing works very well for fusion harmony because it gives us plenty of room for extensions because we have obviously three notes can be the primary triad of the chord and then we also have three notes of extensions. You know, when I say extensions, I mean like major seventh, add nine, add six, you know, add 13, anything that's not that basic triad. So because six has an equal amount of the triad and an equal amount of extensions, it creates a sort of democratic harmonic sound. Besides the fact that um, any more than six, um, and we wouldn't have a lot of uh, choice um, because you don't want to double a lot of notes um, in uh, you know um, in fusion uh, part writing. You want to have as much variety in extensions as possible. So in fusion harmony, we are allowed to use any extensions we want, which basically means any note of the scale can be an extension of the chord. And as you know, diatonic scales contain seven notes. So the fact that we have six parts. Um, uh, means that um, we have a little bit of freedom to choose what extensions we use. It's sort of like the reason why four-part writing is so much more popular than three-part writing, um, because of the fact that even though with three-part writing, you know, you have, a, um, you have, a, you you're able to have full chords. Um, there's not a lot of freedom with that third voice. So if we're if we're doing three-part writing, right? Um, let's say we're trying to make a C major chord, right? So um, uh, we have uh, our soprano is on G, our alto is on C, and then we need to choose our tenor note. Well, if we are trying to build a C major chord, our only choice um, is E, right? So there's really only you know two notes we can choose for the tenor. Um, and if this was in the context of you know a greater harmonic scheme, it might be very awkward for the tenor to jump to E. Um, but we have to go there because that's what the chord demands. Whereas with four-part writing, because of the fact that we have an extra part, you know, we we, are, we have the freedom to double certain notes. So that's why um, uh, our voice leading can be much smoother. So that's a similar reason why um, uh, six-part writing is generally the amount of parts, um, uh, you know, generally used for fusion harmony. Okay. So the scales that we're going to be using with fusion harmony 
are the Dorian mode and the Lydian mode. These are basically like the fusion versions of uh, minor and major. If you're familiar with the Greek modes, or if you you know watch these previous videos, you, you should you should be familiar with these. Um, you should be familiar with these modes. But there are specific reasons why these are employed instead of the normal you know uh, major Ionian and uh, natural minor uh, Aeolian scales. There are reasons why these modes are employed instead of those. Um, and it's to avoid a particular dissonance that uh, jazzers, um, generally speaking, uh, don't really, didn't really like a lot um, when they were developing the system of harmony. And that is the interval of the minor ninth. A lot of people consider it the most dissonant interval. I think it's more dissonant than the tritone. I can stand the tritone a lot easier than I can a minor ninth. Um, and as you know, a minor ninth is really just a minor second. But for some reason, it sounds even more dissonant when it's spaced like a minor nine. Okay, so um, let's figure out why this dissonance exists in the normal major and minor modes, and how the uh, modal version, the Dorian and uh, uh, Lydian, help us to avoid this dissonance. Okay, let's say we're in the key of C major. Okay, and when I say major, I'm just talking about the normal Ionian uh, major mode. Okay, every single solitary note scale works constantly by jazz standards with um, uh, the tonic triad except for one note and I think you'll probably figure out what it is okay so obviously the, the tonic note works second degree of the scale works um, it uh, even though it does create a major second dissonance or a major ninth they were okay with that again the, the minor ninth is the only dissonance they didn't like so E is fine F is our bad note, okay? F creates a minor ninth dissonance with the third degree of the scale, which exists in our tonic triad, okay? So it doesn't sound really good over the, 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 um, the tonic triad. And the other notes, G, A, B, the fifth, sixth, and seventh degrees of the scale, they are all fine. It's this fourth degree of the scale that creates a minor ninth dissonance with the tonic triad, okay? And as you might have guessed, the way that that's avoided is very simple, just by raising that fourth degree of the scale, which gives us the Lydian mode. Right? Doesn't sound nearly as bad as... Right? So that's why they use the, the Lydian mode, because it, of, by raising the fourth degree of the scale, you, you avoid that um, uh, minor ninth in between the fourth degree of the scale and the third degree of the scale. And um, you turn it into a major ninth, which they considered much, much, uh, much more consonant in interval. Okay, so um, it's the same exact reason for the the minor mode. Okay, let's just build an A minor mode and make it easy on ourselves. A natural minor goes to the notes. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Here we go. The sixth degree of the scale, which in the case of A minor is F. That's what creates. That is what creates our minor ninth uh, dissonance with the the fifth degree of the scale. Okay, and again, that problem is solved by raising the scale, which, of course, raising the sixth degree of a natural minor scale turns it into the Dorian mode. Which renders every single note of the scale consonant with the tonic triad. Okay, so. Um, the reason they use those modes, then the bottom line is, in order to avoid um, that dissonance, okay? So that's why those modes are primarily used. It's basically like the Lydian is their major and the Dorian is their minor, okay? So, um, uh, the CRs used are either third relationships or the tritone, and that's, the reason is, that's because these are the most spacey, out there sounding chords, okay? So, um, uh, for example, um, if we were uh, in the key of C major, or let's just say if we were at the tonic of C, okay, uh, we could go a third, any type of third, um, in either direction, up or down, okay, um, or a sixth, because sixths just invert to thirds, right? So, for example, we could go up a major third to E, so C major to E major, C major to E major, right, which that sounds pretty spacey, or a minor third up, which would be E flat also sounds spacey, or we could go downward, we could go down a major third to A flat, or we could go down uh, a minor third to A, right, all, again, all very spacey sounding chords, and then the final one is the tritone, of course, which is the most spacey one of them all, and when you add extensions to this, uh, or excuse me, right, 
it starts sounding really fusiony, and it, and it loses that uh, sort of blatantly spacey quality when you add all these extensions. It dulls the weirdness, if that makes any sense. Okay. So um uh, so yeah, these, these are gonna be our that's gonna be our harmonic palette in, in terms of chord choices. Okay. So um. The bass can be jumpy because all of the chords have to be in root position. Okay, so if you've ever taken four part writing, um, you realize that a lot of times what composers would do to make a bass line more melodic um, is employ um, uh, inversions of chords in order to make the bass line smoother. I'll give a perfect example. If we take the canon chord progression, right? C. Um, here, let me uh, move this down. C. We take that chord progression and just use root position chords. You can see the bass line is very jumpy. It's not really very melodic. But what we can do is we can employ um, uh, inversions of chords. Instead of using G in root position, we can use G in first inversion. So listen to the bass line now. We can do the same thing with E minor, first inversion, then F root position, then C first inversion, then F. Now the bass line, which was previously, is, which is much more melodic. Okay, so we don't do that in fusion harmony. Okay, we don't necessarily care that the bass line is incredibly um, uh, uh, melodic because of the fact that we want all of our chords to be in root position. Okay. Um, uh, generally, the harmonic rhythm in fusion harmony is much slower than four-part writing. You know, again, with that, it's every every uh, beat. Yeah. You move chords very fairly quickly, whereas fusion harmony, you know, kind of stays in the same spot for a little bit of a while, and the chord sort of needs to lock in. Okay, so because of that, if you used a lot of inversion. Um, uh, inversions naturally want to resolve. They're not really satisfying. You know, first inversion chords sound kind of muddy, um, and second inversion chords really it sounds like a pedal tone that wants to lead to the dominant, right? Which would be known as a uh, cadential six four chords if you've ever taken like you know traditional Roman numeral tonal harmony. Um, so so yeah. So bottom line is we want all of our chords to be in reposition, um, which means the basses can be j jumpy, but that being said, all other parts besides the bass should be as stepwise and smooth as possible. Okay, so our goal, um, our goal that we're going to attempt with each chord's uh, voice leading, is to have two parts move up, two parts move down, and two parts stay the same. Which of course works, you know, with six part writing. Um, we get all our parts covered there. Okay, obviously this is not going to be possible in every case, but this is our goal. We want to have as much. Um, uh, uh, democracy with the part writing as possible. We have, we we'll put it this way, we want to have as much variety of part motion um, as possible. But if any one of these is more important than the other, I would say for notes to say the same. That's the most important. Uh, you know, if all else fails, try to make as many notes in common as possible because otherwise it starts to get sounding really choppy. And fusion harmony needs to sound smooth like butter. Okay. So, um, uh, generally speaking, you want to try to not double notes, but if you have to double a note, you can double the tonic of the chord or the fifth of the chord. You should never, du never double the third or any of the extensions, uh, just ever, period. Okay. So, yeah, you should only double a note when the voice leading uh, demands. Okay. So, that, that pretty much covers sort of the, the basic precepts of uh, fusion harmony. Uh, so, the first thing that we're going to do um, is just create a simple little progression like we normally do, and then we're going to part write it, which is the real important thing. Um, and that, that's what I meant when it's voice leading driven. Uh, fusion harmony, it doesn't matter so much that you come up with some really profound progression. It's just a matter of you part writing that progression and extrapolating it onto all six parts very effectively. That's what's going to make it sound like a good fusion progression. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Or we'll just start on C because it's easy. Um, uh, easy. Huh? Uh, uh, okay, so we can move, uh, let's see, let's just move up, remember, we, we're allowed to move a third in any direction, up or down, or the tritone, so we'll, move, we'll go to, uh, E, um, and then we'll go, we'll go down a minor third to, uh, D flat, or let me make these, this text bigger, I just realized you probably can't see this. So we'll do C, E, um, uh, D flat, um, and then, let's see, we'll go down to, to A, and then we'll... That's good enough for now. So that's going to be a progression. C, E, D flat, A. Okay, so 
I'm just gonna be using the string patch um, uh, for this. And the reason we're using a DAW is because of the fact uh, that I think uh, it's easier to see um, vertical part writing in the DAW. Um, the reason is in uh, 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 sheet music, you know, you're going to have different strings on different staves, so it's difficult to see how the intervals relate to each other, whereas the piano roll, everything is laid out on one track. So in this particular, usually I like sheet music better, but in this particular instance, I think it's better to um, uh, use our, our DAW. Okay, so uh, what am I doing? Open piano roll, and then I also, let me open, or not that, not the piano. Uh, uh, keyboard, right? I'll leave this up here so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Okay. All right. So first, let's just go ahead and create our, our C chord. So we'll just put in the bass first. It's usually the first thing that we do. Um, probably make it pretty fairly high. You generally don't want to get too low with fusion chord progressions. Um, and then we'll jump down to this low E, uh, and then we'll go down D flat, and then up to A. Okay, so I've just put in our um, uh, uh, our tonic roots of the chord. Okay. All right. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to um, uh, construct our first chord. Okay. So we'll just make it easy. We'll make it a G, um, E. B, so we have, I'm not sure why it's not showing up notes on this keyboard, maybe I'll have to play it for that to, to work properly, but in any case, so we have C, we have the root of the chord, we have G, the fifth of the chord, we have E, the third of the chord, and we have um, uh, B, which is the seventh of the chord, um, so we can also have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the sharp eleventh of the chord, we're missing one note, so let's see, we'll just go ahead and put the, uh, uh, 13th of the chord. Okay, so we haven't doubled any notes here. We're just using different notes of the Lydian scale. Okay, that sounds nice. That sounds really nice. Um, hmm. I'm going to have to slow down this harmonic rhythm. It's way too fast. <laughs> Alright, let's see here. We'll make it into a four bar progression. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look for opportunities, and this just takes practice. We're going to look for opportunities where um, uh, this chord can voice lead smoothly into the next chord. So we're moving from uh, the uh, the tonic of C to the tonic of E. Okay, and we'll just we'll just stay with major or Lydian. All right. Um, so uh, uh, I think uh, just immediately looking at this, I I noticed that A okay um, can move stepwise directly up to A sharp. Again, stepwise motion is great. Um, and A sharp is the Lydian four or the uh, uh, sharp uh, eleven. Put it that way. Um, uh, so it works with E, okay? So it works with the sharp 11 of E. So this uh, F sharp um, can stay the same, okay? This is a perfect example of where we can employ oblique motion because F sharp uh, is the, the, the Lydian 4 of C, but it also is the major 9th of E. So perfect note to hold over, okay? So um, uh, this uh, B... Could move upward to um, uh, C sharp, which is the add six, um, the sixth degree of the scale of E. So that's good. We can do that. Um, uh, this E, we obviously don't want to double any notes, so we're probably going to move this E somewhere. So I say we move it because we've been moving these parts upward. Let's go ahead and move it downward to um, uh, D sharp, which is the major seventh. But now we are missing the the third of the the, uh, the third of the scale. Um, so actually this tenor voice right here can move up in stepwise motion from G to G sharp, which is the perfect opportunity because, um, uh, uh, and th this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. So you, you might say, well, this, this voice is moving up, this voice is moving up, uh, so why would we want to have another voice moving up? Wouldn't we want to have another voice uh, staying the same um, to have as much democracy with the part writing as possible? Well, yes, but that being said, um, the only two notes that are required we have to have in every chord is you, you know probably remember it's like this in any system of harmony is the first degree of the scale and the third degree of the scale we need the root of the chord of course and we need the third to determine whether or not it's major or minor so we're missing the third so this is a case of where it's okay to violate the goal because of the fact that we need to have the third 
of um, uh, the chord, which in this case, the third of E, the chord E major, is going to be G sharp, okay? So we've, we've had this nice uh, little thing here. I'll go and slow the tempo down. So let's, let's hear what this, uh, this voice saying sounds like. Oh, listen to that. That's beautiful. Uh, sorry, there's a plane outside right now. But um, uh, I'm just going to wait until it passes. Okay, so yeah, so that warm, delicious, spacey sort of sound is exactly what we're going for. And if you do something wrong, if you, if you, you know, don't follow any one of these, uh, these rules that we've been talking about, it's going to become quickly apparent. It's not going to sound right. It's not going to sound like fusion harmony. So it's, it's kind of interesting how rigid this system is. But in any case, let's uh, let's keep going. So our next chord is D flat. Okay. So let's just look. Um, uh, I I think and and I like to um, let me see if I can figure out a good way to explain this. I like to have as much variety in part writing, not only vertically but also horizontally. In other words, if like the top line, the soprano voice, whatever you want to call it, if it moved upward, then I want to try to not have it move upward again. I want to try to make it have as much variety horizontally as well as ver vertically. So because of the fact that the soprano voice move upward, maybe we can uh, hold this note over. So this note right here is A sharp, which is inharmonically the exact same thing as B flat. Okay, So A sharp um, works, as we've already established, as the, the, the sharp 11 of E. And it also is the, the add 6, or you could call it the 13. Um, you know what, just for the purposes of this video, I'm going to refer to sharp 11 as um, Lydian 4. Uh, which that's just the sharp in fourth degree of the scale, and I'm going to refer to um, uh, 13, the thirteenth of the scale as add six, just because I think most people think about it in terms of add six and sharp four. It's just when once you, when you get up to like elevenths and thirteenths of the chord, it's really a pain. So I'm just gonna from now on refer to those as four and add six. Anyway, so yeah, so this A sharp can become B flat. Um, so it's basically it's remaining the same. So now it is the add six um, of. Uh, D flat. Okay, so perfect opportunity to remain the same. Uh, this, uh, you know, uh, F sharp can move stepwise down to F, and then we have the the third of the chord, right? F is the third of D flat, so that works nicely. Okay, um, uh, this uh, C sharp can move down to C, um, which becomes the uh, major seventh of uh, D flat, so that works nicely. Um, so uh, let's see what else we can do here. Okay, so. Um, this note can stay the same because this is the is D sharp. It can become E flat. Um, it is the major seventh of E, right? But it can uh, become the uh, major ninth of D flat. Okay, so perfect note to maintain. All right, um, and then uh, I think this note can actually stay the same too. Uh, I don't think we're missing anything. We, we have the third of the chord. We have, uh, yeah, this should be nice. And the fact that, again, like I said, if you want to have an abundance of any one type of motion, you can just go with uh, uh, oblique motion or keeping parts the same because it'll make it sound really smooth. So let's listen to this. Uh, am I missing any parts? One, two, three, four, five, six. Nope. Oh, listen to that. That is so delicious. Oh, yummy. It's like a cherry pie with sorbet on top, drizzled in whipped cream, and eaten on a Hawaiian beach with the cool breeze blowing your hair majestically in the wind. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so our next chord is A, right? Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, we could keep this the same, this note right here, which is G sharp. Um... We could keep it the same, but uh, I don't want to keep it the same for two reasons. One, it creates a dissonant interval with the bass. And we're okay with dissonant intervals, as long as it's not the minor ninth, of course, but we're, we're generally okay with dissonant intervals, um, with the exception of the, dis the interval between the bass note and the tenor voice, or the voice that's directly above the bass. Okay, so if, if, if we're numbering these voices from top to bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's between voices six and five, okay, these bottom two voices, we don't want them to have um, a, um, because as you probably know, when you get down into the lower bowels of uh, frequencies, dissonant intervals start to sound really, really muddy. They're much more bearable up in the, uh, the, the upper section. And this has to do with the overtone series, right? Um, uh, the lower you get, 
um, with a particular interval, their overtones, their interacting overtones, which in this case are very dissonant, um, uh, the higher you are, it's in dog whistle territory, right? It's way up here, and your ear cannot um, perceive it nearly as strongly. But the lower you move the notes down on the piano, this is why there are some intervals, um, and I, I think I, I might have talked about this before in some other video, but this is why certain intervals, like the minor six, which sounds consonant, high up on the piano, the lower it gets, it starts to sound really, really dissonant because it's overtones are interfering with each other in a frequency spectrum that is much more audible to the human ear. Okay, so that's why we don't want to have G sharp um, because it'll make that not low dissonance. And the other reason is because it already remained the same, so I don't want it to remain the same again. You know, we already had oblique motion, so I want a new type of motion here. Okay, so um, uh, we could have it go up to um. Uh, um, uh, the major nine, which because of the fact that that's further, that even though it's still a dissonance, it's not as bad of a dissonance. It might still sound weird, so we'll just we'll just let's do it. Or we might want to just have it go up to A. Um, I, yeah, actually, I think it's okay to double the tonic here because I think it'll just sound smoother. Okay, so we'll just double the tonic. Um, or we could have it go down to the fifth degree of the scale. That's a bit of a leap there, but I think it'll sound nice. Okay. Um. So. Um. We'll have um, uh, this note, which was uh, D sharp. We'll have it go down to C sharp, um, which is nice stepwise motion, and that becomes so. Now we have the the full chord of A major, the root, the fifth, and the third of the scale. Okay, so uh, this can move. The C can move down to B, which makes um, this nice stepwise motion. Okay, so hopefully we can. It looks like we're gonna not. No, we might not be able to have oblique motion in this case, but because we have so much step mo stepwise motion, I think it'll be okay. So this F natural is gonna go up to F sharp, which becomes the add six of A major. Um, and uh, or actually, you know what? Let me think about this. I think I will have this. Um, uh, what is this? B flat. B flat move up to B natural, but. I'm, I'm then going to take this B natural and move it down to the uh, major seventh of the scale. Okay, so I just did a little switcheroo there. Okay, so now the chord reading would be A, which is the root, um, E, which is the fifth, uh, C sharp, which is the third, um, uh, G sharp, which is the major seventh, and then F sharp, which is the add six, and then um, B, which is the uh, add nine. <laughs> keep, keep track of all that is difficult. Um, so again, we, we don't uh, um, we don't have any oblique motion here, so it might sound a little choppy, but we'll hear what it sounds like. I think I think it's fine. Um, uh, I'm just looking real quick to see if there's any opportunity. The problem is there are very few notes in common uh, when you are, are going a major third relationship, okay? That's just something to be aware of. Um, there, you don't have as many notes in common from this chord to the next chord. Um, I think there are only like a couple of notes in common. The, the main one is this uh, this G sharp, but again, we don't want to hold it over. But you know what? Let's just go ahead and try just for the sake of doing it. We will hold this G sharp over, and then whatever, whatever else was doing the G sharp will become... E. Uh, it's going to create a little bit awkward voicing, but it might sound cool. Sometimes when you have these really close dissonances up high, as long as they're up high, they sound cool. We'll hear what this sounds, and maybe it'll be better or worse than the other solution we had. Oh, I like that. That's nice. Oh, yeah. So you always got to try things out. So yeah, so close dissonances sound cool if they're if they're high. Remember, the lower they get, the more weird they can sound. You don't want to overuse them, but I think that sounds I think it sounds really nice. Okay, so yeah, that pretty much covers uh, fusion harmony. The only other thing we need to worry about is minor chords. So we'll just add a couple minor chords on this. So one thing that we can do is we can just take our existing chord and literally just turn it to minor, um, which is something that they do very commonly, and that is done very simply by simply lowering the third degree of the scale the uh, seventh degree of the scale as well as the uh, fourth uh, degree of the scale okay so so let's see this is the nine so we can just maintain it this right here um, that's the six we can maintain it 
That is the fifth, so we can maintain it. Uh, uh, this is the third degree of the scale, so we can lower it. This is the uh, um, uh, major seventh, or the seventh, yeah, the seventh, so we can lower it. And then we can obviously keep our rule. So we'll hear what that sounds like. Yummy! That is so delicious. All right, so we'll go ahead and go to one more minor chord. It's pretty much the same, you know. Um, so we're we at A. So we, we haven't used a tritone example, but then again, we just we came from D flat a second ago, didn't we? Oh wait, no, that wouldn't. A tritone would be E flat. I don't think we've been to E flat. No, we haven't been to E flat. Okay, so we'll go a tritone relationship to E flat. And we'll go down to um, uh, this nice low warm E flat. Cool beans. Okay, so um, uh, we're gonna have to to um. Uh, uh, be really careful about this because again tritone the tritone is like the furthest possible chord away So we have to be really on the lookout for chords that are in common. Okay, so If we're at E flat, we can keep this add six right here So we'll take this G we can move the stepwise up to a which is this is gonna sound really interesting. And again, this voicing is close right here, so I wanna to try to open it up, because I, I think I might have talked about before. With string writing, you don't wanna have too much close voicing. The more open it is, the better it sounds, just because of the way the instrument's overtone series are. Their timbres lend themselves. So, um. Okay, so we have the, the root of the chord. This might sound weird. So we have the root, we have the... I'm concerned about this tritone right next to the bass, that's what I'm concerned about. But I think I'm just gonna leave it at G. Okay, which is just basically becoming the third, which means we don't need what this, we don't need this. So I think we'll... Ooh, that might be interesting. That's a really sharp dissonance there, but we'll, we'll see if it works. <laughs> we'll see what it sounds like. Oh, <laughs> that's definitely a sharp dissonance, but I love it, and it sounds so fusiony. Um, so let's just do one one more chord, and this next chord is going to be one that um, uh, really goes to this wide open voicing. Okay, so if we're going from uh, here, you know, we, I'm just going to go ahead and use a minor second. Um, it's not generally something that's used a lot in fusion, but I think it'll I think it'll sound nice here because this B can move up, this uh, A can move down to uh, G sharp, this. Can move down this D can move down to C sharp. Oh, so we're moving to D major, that's the chord. Okay, so we have uh, I'll, I'll just build the chord and then I'll tell you. Okay, so we don't have any notes in common, but I think that's okay in this instance. Okay, so our D chord is D. Uh, a, which is the fifth of the scale, um, uh, E, which is the ninth degree of the scale, um, uh, C sharp, which is the um, uh, la, 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 the major seventh of the scale, and uh, G sharp, which is the um, Lydian four, and then B, which is the add six. I think we're missing the third of the chord, though. Yeah, so I think I'm gonna opt to have the uh, the third of the chord rather than the ninth because we, we need the third of the chord there. And again, that's that's a pretty big jump. Um, not something that's super um, uh, super wanted, but because of the fact that we have stepwise motion and all the other parts, I think it's uh, this sort of jump is you know if we also had a jump in the bass, then it might not be um, uh, we might not accept it. But in this particular instance, because every other part is stepwise, I think it's okay to have this jump in an inner voice. You know, again, th these rules are just guidelines. They're not, 
Um, you know, you need to understand why these rules were invented, and if you understand why, then you can know when you, you, it's okay to break the rules. Okay, so I have a feeling this is going to sound delicious, but we'll just listen to this final chord progression. Oh, that is so juicy. Yeah. Okay, let me see if it plays on this keyboard. Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. So you, I'll, I'll show you the... Uh, so you can see what's actually happening here. Let me start over. Let me see how wide the space it is. Oh, that is just delicious. Okay. So yeah, so there is uh, a brief overview of um, one uh, school of thought when it comes to uh, fusion uh, part writing. Um, so uh, I know it's a very technical when I'm talking about like note values and stuff. And uh, um, uh, you know, let me uh, let me know if you misunderstood anything in the video or if um, I didn't explain something well, and I will try to clarify that uh, over uh, the uh, YouTube comment section. Just feel free to ask. Um, so yeah, but in write these down, you know, I might be able to put these in the description or something, but the best way to get used to the system of harmony is just by writing, you know, a, a fusion progression yourself. Okay. Just, oops, try to follow these precepts and kind of do what I did and just write a fusion progression. And then once you are confident that you can, then see if you can implement it in a song, you know? And again, it's like any tool. You don't have to use it 100% of the time. You can just be writing something that's totally normal and like, you know, I want to pull out a fusion progression. This is the perfect time for that. And then your audience who's listening are going to be like, whoa, where did that come from? You know, it's because you're following a system that gets you outside of your own tendencies. Um, so anyway, I hope that was uh, uh, helpful. And uh, uh, yeah, so I will see you guys uh, later. Have a, a great week.